Welcome to Best Story Wins. I'm Josh Ritchie, and I'm here with my co-host, Jason Lenko. And today, our guest is Mike Constantiner, co-founder of Freestyle. Hey, Mike, how's it going? What's up, guys? Hello, everyone. Hey, Mike. Hey, so Mike, you're the co-founder of Freestyle. Um, can you give us a quick overview of your company, what your day-to-day looks like, and also what makes uh, your brand unique? Yeah. Yeah, so Freestyle, uh, we make baby care for modern baby makers. Um, we launched in the May, uh, we launched in May of 2022. So we just crossed one year in market. Um, and yeah, we make baby care. Our first product is the first and only tree free diaper. Uh, so, um, uh, we basically worked with a manufacturer for two years to develop a diaper that has, uh, you know, uh, had a sustainability element to it that wasn't greenwashing and it wasn't just there for the purpose of being sustainable, just to, for marketing. Um, uh, and the idea is to kind of use the diapers as our beachhead product and expand to a bunch of other baby care and um, effectively like parenting related products um, over the course of the next few years. Yeah, that's really cool. And um a question I bet a lot of people ask you is, how did you get started with diapers? And also, why the focus on baby care? Yeah, well, this is actually, I mean, uh, it's really all my co-founder because he was at another diaper brand before. Uh, he was on the founding team of a, uh, uh, a diaper brand that launched in like 2019. And he left. And we got connected just serendipitously through a mutual friend. And we were both kind of in points of our career where we were figuring out our, our next moves. And um, it was like right before COVID. And, you know, we got connected on the kind of context that we're both dads and we both like consumer brands. And we just had a phone call and, you know, that just got the snowball rolling. Um, Russ had some ideas kind of to do things differently in baby care, you know, some stuff around a dad brand. Um, and so, you know, I got, I, I, my son at the time and, you know, I was really excited about the idea and, and what's been, you know, so great about the relationship is, you know, a very complimentary skill set where Russ really focuses on the operations and supply chain and the business and the numbers. Um, and then I run kind of all the creative and brand and content. And so kind of like, I think in those early days, we saw that, you know, like, that we each were filling missing pieces of each other and, you know, combined, we could actually do a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, it only took one call for yeah. you guys to kind of anyway, know. Yeah, it took, yeah. But I mean, basically, you know, he, it, he was kind of talking about this idea and I, you know, I was just like, Hey man, I'm like, as I always am, I'm like, I'm happy to help however I can. And he sent me over some stuff and I was like, you know, I, I really think like, I gave him some feedback and then I wrote this whole like monologue about what it means to become a parent. And, um, I think it really resonated with him. And so like, you know, we just, we kept going back and forth on this stuff. And then, um, <clears throat> he actually flew out to New York at the beginning of January and he's like, Hey man, why don't we just like grab a beer or something? And I was like, cool. And, you know, we got together and we just, you know, it's like one of those things where in hindsight it, you know, it, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't like, oh, let's do this. You know, it was just kind of like, we just, we were just sh- shooting things around and just, you know, it, friendly, just brainstorming and, and the conversations were productive. Um, and I think what was really interesting was like, um, you know, like it was obvious that Russ was like a doer, right? There's a lot of people that are talkers and they have these ideas, but like, I kind of was like, I, you know, I remember being like, let's see what, let's see what like Russ like actually does here because like there's so many people that's like, Hey man, like I want to do this. Can you help me? And I'm like, sure. Like, let me help. And then it's like, yo, where's that deck you said you were going to send me for feedback or like where, like, you know, like you haven't figured out this one simple thing, you know, like it's very common and I get it. Like, it's like a lot of people starting stuff is really, really hard. Um, but Russ actually was putting things in motion, which I really appreciated. So I'm like, shit, like this guy, like he's ready. Like I'm, I'm ready. Let's fucking go. And then COVID happened and I was like, got nothing else to do. So let's really fucking go, you know? So, um, 
Yeah. So it was like, it was like one of those things, like I, 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 I use the snowball analogy a lot for this relationship where it was just like a little push. And then all of a sudden it just kind of like naturally, you know, just gravity was just like, boom. Yeah. That's super cool. I like how, I like how that, that story started. And it's so cool that like you guys compliment each other so well too, right? Cause like that's, that's yeah. another issue with co-founders at times is they both want to do the same thing. Right. Sure. And yeah. the fact that you guys are good at and want to do different things, like I'm, I'm sure that made the snowball getting momentum so yeah. much easier. Right? Oh man, I've been in the other situation before and it led to a failure like really hard and made the relationship brutal. Cause it's like, both people want to do the same things. And like one person thinks that they're better than the other person at that. Nobody wants to do the other stuff. So it's like, it just becomes contentious. Um, and like, you know, one person's always going to lose in that relationship because the other person is going to have certain dynamic about them. That's going to cause them to win. Um, and it's really tough. Like it's really hard. So that's why I like, you know, with and look, of course, like, I get involved in like supply chain and logistics and stuff too. Like as a co-founder, like we're a team and like he helps like with marketing and, and, and brand stuff too. Like, it's like, you know, like a lot of times it's like, it's, it's like, it's not like a perfect, like there's not like a, you know, like a China wall between us. Right. It's like, it's, it's a, it's a team effort, but we definitely have like our areas where we focus and then we just support each other. Right. Like, you know, we're, we're um, in the middle of, you know, some, uh, new production order. Right. And like, you know, last night at like 10 o'clock, I'm sitting there emailing with the manufacturer about some supply chain stuff. Like technically, you know, if you look at like the org chart, like in a big company, like rush should be doing that, but that wasn't the situation. Right. So like we, we were there to help each other out. Um, and, and, and because there's that, like, you know, that is, there is that skill set break, it's like when you start getting into like, okay, what's the big picture here? What's the, you know, the, the, the main focus, then we, we have our responsibilities and like our roles clearly defined. So in your, in your position, what, what's one of the biggest challenges you face and, and how do you navigate that? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I mean, there's like from the top, it's like the co-founder challenges, which are like obvious, right. It's like, it's, it's, uh, the business strategy. It's making sure we have enough capital. Um, we're a VC backed company and very much, you know, in the early stages of this have like developed a business plan that relies on that early stage capital because in our category, diapers and baby care, the minimum orders are huge. Like our minimum order size is like $600,000, right? You can't, you know, this is not like a, you know, an apparel brand or like a beauty brand where, you know, 15 K, can kind of get you up and running. You can start fulfillment outside of your, you know, your garage. You know, our, our first order was like literally, I think something like 15 containers, you know, those like containers you see on the ship, like that's our first order. And that's a very small order in the world that we're in. So we had to raise capital. We, you know, in the early days we rely on venture capital. So that's been like one of the biggest challenges, especially like the kind of fundraising market over the past like year. Thankfully we've closed the round and, you know, we're, you know, we've, we figured out a way to make it happen. Um, and then I think, you know, the next thing is like the team, right. I think like you, you kind of have, I always think of like companies having like, you know, as founder, you got to think about three things. It's like, it's your, <clears throat> it's your product. It's your, it's your team and it's your customers. Um, and like, uh, I think the, the, you know, like, building your team is arguably the most challenging aspect of it, right? Because there's the most um, variables that you don't control, right? There's so much effort, especially at the early stages when you're a small team, every hire you make, whether it's part-time or full-time has such a material impact on the business, right? <clears throat> and finding talent is really hard. And you think you find a really good talent you do as much as you can ahead of time to vet the person and understand who they are and what their skills are going to be. And you do references and you have them do projects and then they show up and they can end up being complete duds. Right. And you try to prepare them for success, but that's not always the case. And it's like, it's arguably like the biggest risk when it comes to like starting companies, I think is like finding the right people. And a lot of times it's just 
fucking luck, man. Like, it's just like you, you find the right, you know, I've had this experience where sometimes it's like somebody you just, you think is going to kill it and they just like fall short. Sometimes you f- find the right person with, you, know, you have relatively low expectations for and they over deliver and you can never prepare for that. Right. Um, I mean, sorry, you can't predict that you can prepare to like have success, of course, but like, you just never know what the reality of like, what's going on in their life like what's going on in their day-to-day what changes happens what happens to these people what ends up being something that inspires them or motivates them and sometimes no matter what you do it's just not going to work out it's not going to it's not going to be the right fit um and so that's like you know that's that's like probably you know the (laughs) another big challenge um and then of course like you know i think trying to make a really big impact as a small company when you have like very limited resources and resources mean time, people and, 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 and capital. Right. So like you're competing again, this is like the, you know, it's always the case, right. (laughs) You're competing with like competitors who have significantly more budget than you have significantly larger teams than you have significantly larger traction than you. And you're coming in, it's like, you know, it's very much this David Goliath versus Goliath kind of situation. So it's like, how do you topple the giant, right? Or how do you like make some kind of impact that gives you a chance to like keep fighting? And so that's really like, I think at the, at the end of the day, like good founders are, are, are ones who can figure out how to, with limited resources, um, make the biggest impact possible in the shortest amount of time and just give themselves the opportunity to stay in the fight. You know, it's like, I think a lot of people, and this is like a, I think where most people fail as, as founders or creating anything. And even going back to what we were talking about earlier about these people that are like doers or not, it's like, you have this great idea, right? And what happens is I think what most people, they get overwhelmed because they see where this could go and they start trying to put things in motion, but they're trying to get to the goal first without like putting a plan and process. That's like the steps along the way. Like I use this analogy a lot of like you're on one side of the street and you need to cross the other side of the street. Like you're not going to like run and try to jump and like clear the whole intersection. Right. Like you got, it's like, it's like, it's obvious, right. You just, you got to take like one step, two step, you know, you just got to step, you make your steps. And that's what building is. It's like, so like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, I think a lot, it's like, how do we just give ourselves the opportunity to make the next step to make, you know, just like keep making steps. And like, if we keep walking, we, we are going to get to the other side. And so, um, that's why that's like something I think a lot about. That's, uh, I I just want to insert a fire emoji right there. It's a great (laughs) response (laughs) on the, uh, front of just, just building you're touching on this, like building startups, building a new brand from scratch, like you said, with limited resources in the early stages. Uh, it's, you know, not everyone has a stomach for it. It's exciting. It's also can be super, uh, exhausting, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, uh, but yeah, the, you're, you're in it, you're doing it. Uh, what, what's the time, one of your favorite stories of a time you took a risk and it either paid off or, yeah. or it, just flopped and, and you learned something valuable from it. You know, it's kind of funny. I was like thinking about this question and I, I think like in one way by like starting a company, it's like the biggest risk you can take, you know, and I carry a lot of pressure as a result of that risk. And so in my like day to day operations of the company, I try to actually minimize like risks. So I'm not like, you know, I try to do as much as I can to kind of like, not say like, fuck it, let's see how this goes, right? I try to like, really be thoughtful and mindful, because especially when it's like, in the early stages, when every dollar really counts, it's really hard to make mistakes. And so I'm not saying like, we've ever made mistakes, you know, like, of course, like, pay $4,000 for some influencer to make some video, and it gets like, we had this situation where it's like, you know, it's like we, this Instagram account had a huge following and she was like, yeah, I really want to make a video for you. And there's a very unique Instagram account 
And I was like, okay, you know, negotiated her rate down a good amount to kind of help delever the risk. And, you know, she posted it and it got like zero traction. I mean, not zero, but like zero, like ROI type traction, right? I'm like, yeah, I kind of knew that was going to happen. And of course, she's like, you know, uh, oh, it's maybe this and we're going to try something else. And it's just like, no, like I kind of knew it. I, I wanted to take the, I wanted to try it just in case, you know, like I, I wanted to see, but. You know, it's rare that I do something like that. I feel like I have a pretty, like a pretty good, um, like barometer at this point of like things that like have the potential to make an impact and things that don't. Um, and so like, I like to kind of do as much work ahead of time to, to, to prevent like these kind of like, you know, wild outcomes. What uh, philosophy do you, you, you mentioned do you have a good barometer on this stuff? Uh, what, what is the philosophy that drives you and your team on, on building out the brand? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the brand team at Freestyle is uh, also known as the make cool shit team. And so like our Slack channel is actually like the make cool shit team. And this is something I learned from a, uh, you know, I have a, a friend who's kind of like a mentor also when it comes to business and branding. And, you know, he's talking about um, this, uh, this clothing brand, Stussy, and I'm sure you guys are all familiar with it. And they've been around since the 80s and they're still around and they're still kicking. And, you know, in the past 40 years, the amount of competitor brands that have gone out of business that have shot up through the roof, gotten acquired, but now they crash and like, you know, nobody wants to wear their stuff anymore. Like Stussy has stayed relevant every year for 40 years. Right. And they do, I guess like there's like, from what I understand, they do the same amount of revenue every single year. And they just like are really good at that. And something that they do is like, I guess a big part of like what he was saying is like, what they do is they just continuously make cool shit. They're just really good at making cool shit. And so I just kind of took that as like, that's our thesis, right? Like that's the theme of our team is like, if we just can continue to make cool shit, people are going to pay attention to us, right? It's impossible for it not to happen. <clears throat> and so we just like, every time I think about it is like, is this cool? You know, like, are people going to like this? And there's like, obviously, you know, there's degrees of like how much people are going to like it or not. But what you want to build is a portfolio of stuff that people can look back on and be like, damn, like if you think about like an artist, right? Like Pablo Picasso, he made, you know, thousands and thousands of pieces of art, right? And there's some of them that are like these masterpieces, you know, and then there's like pencil sketches that he did, right? And it's like, if you look at it as one big collection, like it's cool, man. Like everything he did was really cool. And like, not all of them are the quality of like, you know, some huge painting or mural or something like that. But he just crafted this skill of just like continuously making stuff, continuously making stuff and learning and getting better and, you know, refining. And when you look at it all together, like you can't ignore the talent and like the impact that he had. And that's like how I think about what we, do a freestyle. If we can just continue to make stuff, not all of them, like I said, not all of them are going to be, they're going to be like huge wins or whatever. But like, when you look at the whole collection over the course of time, you know, people should look at that and be like, damn, that was really cool. That's awesome. I, I uh, really like that example of, of Picasso there. Uh, what, what is your make cool shit team excited about right now? What are, what are some of the things you're working on or coming down the pipeline? Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is that we've got our, our next diaper design launching in the fall. Um, so we're rolling out nationwide in every Whole Foods. Um, we've got, so all 515 doors, we're doing our diapers and our wipes, which are a new product that are, uh, are coming, they're like literally being made as we speak. <clears throat> um, so it's like a huge launch for us. And so everything that we're kind of doing right now is geared towards, you know, supporting the launch at Whole Foods. It's going to be, obviously we have D2C, so we're technically nationwide, but from like a wholesale retail perspective, um, we're pretty much all west of the Mississippi. So like Whole Foods is going to give us nationwide um, nationwide coverage. And also it's Whole Foods. It's like the premier grocery chain. So, you know, our goal really is to like, um, you know, do a lot of cool shit 
that supports freestyle as a brand and gets people excited about going into Whole Foods and buying our diapers. So we're working our di- diaper. So all of our diapers are designed in collaboration with different artists. And the idea is that like <clears throat> we regularly kind of rotate with new artists. And once that design is kind of sold out, it's gone forever. Um, like we had our, we had, we launched with two patterns and one of them is this like trippy smiley face. And uh, we sold out of them and like, you know, people are like, where's the smiley face? Like, I want the smiley face. And it's kind of like, Hey, yeah, sorry. They're like gone forever, you know? And, um, so the new pattern with Christina is amazing. Um, and so we're lining up a bunch a big part of what we also do is like, is, um, a bunch of different collaborations, um, on the content side, but also around like merch and accessories related to parenting. So we've done like a mommy and me bucket hat. We did with this kid's clothing brand and this DJ, we did like a, matching like adult and kids sweatsuit uh set we did with uh this other kids clothing brand and this uh stylist uh, she's billy eilish a stylist um we've done a bunch of our own little like merch and accessories but <coughs> um one of the things on the docket is a and this is like a a teaser is like actually i don't know if i want to say it out loud um you already it's started really wild <laughs> do it <laughs> Yeah, we're doing like a custom magic eight ball and it's going to be like parenting. All the answers are like (laughs) parenting related. And so it'll be like a, you know, like a fun, like, you know, trip. And then, um, one of the other things I'm doing, what's an example of the eight ball answers we got to know now. Nah, that's a secret. (laughs) That's a secret. Um, you'll have to ask the eight ball. (laughs) Um, but yeah, another big project like on the brand side that we're we're ramping up is um so we've been doing like these collaborations on the apparel side and I want to like formalize it into um like a kind of a brand within a brand. And so <clears throat> I'm working on the the first few pieces of it right now. Um and it's gonna be it's gonna be called Baby Maker by Freestyle. And so the whole idea behind it is um you know, like a way for parents to wear cool, like cool apparel that's modern and young and and fun. Um, still kind of show this like idea of being a parent, but instead of it saying like number one mom or like, you know, dad, dad life or whatever, you know, it's like, it's something like that feels a little bit more like I love the brand mad happy. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but um, LA based clothing brand. Um, but I want them to feel like it's like something that feels more like they're shopping from mad happy, but it's like rooted in, in parenting. Um, so that's like a big project that we're kind of working on right now and lining up like, uh, the first few pieces of. Yeah, that's super cool. I I love that you guys are, um, building a lifestyle brand, um, which is how I'd, I'd phrase it. Um, and it's, I think what, what part of what makes it so cool, what you're doing is like, it's just super unexpected, right. From a, from a brand a product company that's focused on baby care and diapers currently. Um, going back to what you were talking about a few minutes ago, you were talking about um, the wipes. This, I think, is the second product you're going to be releasing. Um, how how do you all kind of relate to this idea of product market fit, um, whether you have it yet, and also when it's time to create something new? And how did you all decide on wipes is a second product. I mean, to me, I, I get the connection. I'm a dad. I have a couple of kids, yeah. two of which are still in diapers. So I understand like they kind of go together like peanut butter and jelly, um, which is yeah. kind of a gross analogy given what we're talking about. But like, what, what was that process like? Can you kind of walk us through how you were like, okay, like now is the time to do something else and wipes makes sense. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I wish we had launched with wipes. Like it's a, <clears throat> in hindsight, like we, we, Like it was definitely a mistake to not launch with wipes. Wipes are uh, a very high margin product, but they get used like crazy. You know, they're not just for wiping babies' butts. You know, like I'm sure if you have kids, you know that like you have, I mean, people have wipes all over everywhere, right? You wipe down countertops, you wipe hands, you wipe faces, you wipe, you know, smudges. You know, it's like, it's just like a great all around product. Um, And yeah, of course, like, you know, for us, it, it makes sense because they go hand in hand, you know, and then I talk to, um, so one thing that I do is, uh, and I've done this at every company I've ever had. Um, 
as part of your post purchase flow, you get an email that's a plain text email. Um, so it looks like I like manually typed it um, from me. And it's like, Hey, I'm Mike. I'm the founder of Freestyle. Like, thanks for being, you know, thanks for your order. Um, <clears throat> would love to hop on a quick 15 to 20 minute phone call with you. Here's a link to book some time. And so I do like, you know, four or five of these calls a week. And so I'm talking to real customers. And, you know, one of the questions that is part of that uh, conversation is like, what other products would you like to see from Freestyle? And as you can imagine, like naturally, um, wipes was like the number one answer. So, um, and then of course, like, you know, our retail partners are asking for wipes. Um, and, uh, you know, they're just, they're, they're great. Like, you know, if you want to get into like unit economics, right? Like we sell our diaper bundle, um, online for $78 for a monthly subscription. And when you sell diapers, the, it's a really tricky business in general because they're really bulky, right? Like a pack of diapers is really big. And it costs you almost the same amount to ship one pack of diapers as it does to send six. So that's why we, instead of selling like a single pack, we sell you six a month supply. Um, because we would like have our ass eaten to, like uh, handed to us on, on, on shipping charges. Um, and so, um, but our, our AOV is like $78, right? Now you include, uh, four packs of wipes at roughly $5 each, 78 to $98. The beautiful thing is once you get to a certain size and shipping, and that's where we're at, you get charged based on the size of your box versus the weight, right? It shifts over to what they call dim weight, dimension weight. So anything else we can throw in that box is just a creative margin to the business on the DVC side. So, um, you know, the boxes are kind of designed uh, intentionally to have extra space so that we can throw wipes in there. And as we roll out, you know, our merch and like, eventually get into some of our other products, you know, the shipping cost stays the same, but our AOV increases. So, and it's, um, so that, that's a big part of like the business strategy in, in this world. Awesome. That's, that's sounds super smart. Um, so pivoting a little bit to talk about, uh, storytelling, um, the, the name of this podcast is best story wins. And that's, really rooted in our belief that your brand story is the best way to differentiate and then compete and then ultimately win in your market. Um, I would love to hear from you um, on what you think the keys are to crafting and then telling a great brand story. Yeah. So with freestyle, I think I have a, a different approach than like what I think a lot of other brands do. And the way I think about freestyle is freestyle is a platform to allow other parents to tell their story. And so, cause a big part of what we're doing at freestyle is like, if you think about baby care and parenthood and the way it's been portrayed and depicted in the media and just like, you know, in, 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 in all our minds, it's like, as soon as you become a parent, Overnight, you're old, you're lame, you move to the suburbs, everything you were before disappears, your life is over. And anybody who's made that jump realizes that that's not true at all, right? Like, there's a very short window of time, you know, the first few months of a baby's life and mainly mom that is like, you know, it's all encompassing, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. And so what freestyles like aim and what we're trying to do is focus on that light at the end of the tunnel and as you emerge from the tunnel, you haven't lost a, like the sense of who you were before becoming a parent, right? There's the average age of a new mom in the United States is 27 years old. But I bet if you ask a bunch of 20 year olds how old parents are, they're like, I don't know, 40, right? Like it's like, but that's because like, you know, the, I, like I said, that's the way we've been made to think. And I think it's been reinforced by the brands in the baby care space, you know, like, I remember, I mean, a big part of why we're doing freestyle is like my son was two months old and I'm changing his diaper and it's got Mickey Mouse on it. And like this little dude has no idea who Mickey Mouse is. He's not going to know who Mickey Mouse is for the vast majority of the time that he's in diapers. And he's not going to care. Like he does has zero thought as to what diaper it goes on. him. So for us, it's like, you know, we're really building a brand that's focused on the parents versus the kids, you know, and you know, so as we think about that and we think about, well, 
if every if everybody else is kind of like the Disney of baby care, like how do we be the MTV? Like how do we do stuff that's like more wild, more fun, youthful without being childish, creative? And I know that like Russ and I as founders can't tell all those stories, right? So like we've set freestyle up and that's why we do the collaborations. That's why we bring in artists like Christina Martinez and Samantha Duenas and Amanda Merton. And through the collaborations, we're telling their story, what it's been to be like a DJ before parent, you know, before parenting and then like having kids and like, what's it like being a DJ after the fact? Christina, she just had her third kid. She's more successful than she's ever been as an artist, right? And so like, we want to be aspirational and inspirational to the next generation of, 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 uh, of, of parents. Um, and we can't like freestyle can't do that on its own. So like, for me, it's like freestyle is the foundation. And then we just work with all these different people to kind of let them tell their stories of parenthood so that other people can like find a point of entry and relate to like that. Oh, like I'm a DJ or I'm an artist. Like I'm so scared of being a parent because like, how am I going to paint anymore? Like when I have a kid running around, Oh, well, here's Christina Martinez. She's got three kids and she's like one of the most successful artists in the country right now. Like, She's going to tell you how she did it. And so that's how I think about storytelling from a brand perspective. You know, like I'm not trying to be like everything to everyone myself. Like I can't, like it's literally impossible. Freestyle can't, like freestyle on its own can't. So it's more about creating this like collective to tell stories. Yeah, that's really cool. And then um, reading between the lines here, it seems like that, there's that through line of like the overarching brand story or ethos that, Hey, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And that's being told through each of these collaborators, personal stories. Is that right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, and I look, and then look freestyle, we do it too. Right. I mean, we do it like with the design and our colors and the, I mean, even the name and like our branding, right? Like the foundation has to be there for it to be authentic and for it to all work to, you know, all work together. Um, you know, like, like all of our packaging, every size comes in a different color. Like we want to stand out on shelf. We want people to look at us. And like our, our diaper designs have these like, you know, trippy smiley faces and stuff like that. Like, you know, the, the idea is like for people to stop. Like I really want people to like stop and be like, I can't believe that's a diaper, you know? But then for them to be like, oh, duh. Like obviously this is what a diaper should be because they should have the same experience I had when it's like, oh yeah, why does my diaper have Mickey Mouse or Big Bird on it or like rainbows and unicorns? Like, like like that looks dumb. Mm -hmm. And how are you all filtering to essentially decide on who to bring in as collaborators to help tell their story that further strengthens the freestyle story? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's just like a talent thing. You know, I've like, I've worked with creative talent for 20 years now, you know, like I worked at, I I literally worked at a talent agency and then I launched a video creation app where I ran all the kind of content and community. So I worked with video creators for years. I worked at, you know, we sold that company to Vimeo, continued to work with video creators. Um, my first personal care brand was kind of similar to this where we worked with a lot of like creatives and kind of influencers to tell stories. And so I think it's just like, you know, I've just built the kind of skill set to, to identify that talent and figure out like who can actually, you know, make an impact, who can tell a good story and who can't. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know that about your background in terms of the, the talent agency experience. Um, I mean, I was like, I was an assistant for a year, you know, I wasn't like a, you know, I wasn't like an agent or anything, but you know, I was in that world. It was like, you know, you, you definitely learn about, you know, you, you definitely, you definitely soak up a lot of information and, and, uh, kind of understand like, you know, sorry, it was just like my, you know, it was like my one one of like, of like understanding talent. Yeah. That's super cool. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of lessons you, you picked up on there that, yeah, that are, that are being implemented now in what you're doing. Um, and then in terms of the, the kind of, I guess, feedback from the market on how that story is resonating with people, how are you getting that feedback? Is it mainly through, those conversations you're having with customers or is it through other channels and forums? Yeah. I mean, there's so many different ways to do it, right? Like the customer feedback is really good. Um, 
it's, you know, it's, res- it's social media, like, you know, it's sort of like response on social media. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is like, we think about like our sales and then more importantly on the D to C side, our retention rates, right? So like it's a monthly subscription. So like, you know, it's working if people keep buying. And so like for us, when we set out like our, our KPI or, you know, the number one goal for us was like, if this is all working, our KP, our, our subscriber retention rates should be really good because there's no bullshit there. Right. Like, and they're really good. They're the highest we've seen. And from what we understand in the diaper category, anybody seen in the D2C side. And so what that means is like people like the product, people like the designs, people like the price, you know, they like everything we're doing enough to keep buying from us. And so, um, you know, that's like, there's like lots of qualitative feedback, but it's like the quantitative feedback that I think is like the most important thing to measure whether or not what you're doing is working or not. And like, you know, like everything's not working. Like it's not like a perfect company by any means. Like we don't have like, not everything's figured out. Like, you know, we're still refining. We're, you know, we have new packaging coming out because we totally fucked up our first packaging. You know, like, honestly, like it's, we thought it was going to look great and it didn't look great. And that's hurt us, you know, like really bad. And um, like I said, not having wipes hurt us, I think really bad. Like it's one of those, you don't know kind of like what the impact was, but like, like we know for sure it, it was like a negative impact by not having wipes. Um, and so those are all things you kind of like, you see in the numbers, like the numbers don't lie. And that's like, like when, it, you know, when you're, if you're a founder and I've made this mistake in the past where you know, you can lie to yourself and you can like twist the numbers to make you feel good. And you can look at bad data and find like glimmers of hope and be like, yes, that's, you know, like it's working when it's, when you know, it's not like, you know, it's not. So you have to like, you know, kind of back to that product market fit thing. Like you really, really have to be honest with yourself and be ready. The beautiful thing about being like a startup, like early stage company is your ability to fucking pivot. And like iterate, right? And if you don't, it's like you're dead. Like you're just, it's not going to work. It's very, very, very rare, very rare for companies to like launch and day one, it's off to the races, you know? Like, like it's just like, it's just such a lottery ticket within a lottery ticket of like, of entrepreneurship. And so 99.99% of companies are going to launch. And I mean, even when you think about like before you even launch, like what your idea is going into it and what the ultimate reality of it is once you kind of like build the company, it's like rarely ever exactly what you set out to build, you know? And I think the good founders are guided by the data. And I think the bad founders are the ones that, um, you know, lie to themselves about what that data is telling them. Oh, I could go down some rabbit trails with you on that, but I'll... (laughs) I want to, I want to come back to the, uh, (laughs) the, the, on the customer front, uh, I I love the theme is mistakes, but, but, uh, (laughs) on the brand, like when you see other brands trying to connect with would be customers. And I think this could relate to your, your point on, you know, even knowing when to pivot or change things just on the, on the product market fit front. But what are, what are the biggest mistakes you see brands making when trying to connect with would-be customers? Probably like not trying enough things, I guess, you know, like I think, and like I, and you know, full candor, like I make this, this mistake regularly. And I think it's something my co-founder is like really, really good about is like, this kind of goes back to my aversion to risk in a way. Like, it's like, I'm more like, I tend to want to just like, this is what I want to do. And like, this is it, you know, whereas He's kind of like, dude, just do a lot of things small and test and learn and like figure out like, you know, like how do you know that for sure, right? Like how do you really know that that's the right way to go? Run a test, you know, like spend very little money and just start informing yourself once again through data. Um, and so I think that like, you know, um, like most people aren't try- in the early days aren't trying enough things to connect with their customers. And I... Um, and I know it's hard because it's like, 
you only, once again, you only have a certain amount of resources and bandwidth. So it's like, you know, maybe pick one area to focus on and try a bunch of different things. Like there's, I know there's like a lot of like kind of shared wisdom in the DDC space where it's like, you should only do meta advertising. Don't even think about Google or any of these other stuff until you hit like half a million dollars or something like that. Right. And I think that like, in a way that makes a lot of sense because it's hard to like, you can also test all these different platforms. You're going to, you know, how are you going to create the creative and the assets and like, you know, can you really manage all that data and can you really focus on all that kind of stuff? But I think if you like, you're able to kind of like say like, this is what we're going to test right now and just be laser focused on that and test a bunch of different stuff within that context on a small scale, figure out what's works and you can start kind of like eliminating things that don't. And then you can kind of say, cool, like we feel really good now about this channel. Like let's focus on this now. Right. So I think that that's probably like a big part of like the mistakes that people make on, on, on not reaching customers. And like it too, like it, a lot of it just takes time, you know, like it takes time. Like we're a year in and like the amount we've learned about freestyle in the past year is insane. Right. Like we thought we knew a lot a year ago and like we knew nothing. And like, like I said, it's like, it's just like, it's just staying in the fight. Like, it's just like, you're not going to know, you're not going to know all the answers day one. And so it's like, you just got to keep giving yourself the opportunity to like get, you know, take the next step or like get at bat. You know, it's not about like hitting the home run. It's like, just get on base. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, we look at things, I think, pretty similarly where we like to try new things all the time too because, yeah, knowing what doesn't work is probably just as valuable as knowing what does work. Oh, yeah. Maybe even in some cases more valuable. More, because, yeah. Yeah, in the back of your mind, if you haven't tried those things, there's this like pull but hesitancy, right? Um, maybe in some cases to like experiment and try new things out. But once you've sort of tried and failed – you can just basically say like, okay, that door is close, like on to the next yeah. thing, or maybe yeah. we double down our efforts on what we know is already working. And so I think it's just uh, to your point, like it's, it's table stakes with being a business owner and with being a, an entrepreneur. And I think uh, not realizing that or being too averse to f- taking risk and failing, like that seems to be, I think for a lot of people, one of the big hangups or one of the things that's hard to kind of break through mentally. Yeah. yeah, and it's funny how yeah. it's. <laughs> I was just thinking about how you answered that initially too, when you said like the the mistake of not trying enough things, and it, it's it's wild how this muscle memory kind of forms where it's like once you've failed on enough things or you've been like, especially I think it's most damaging when you're really excited and really believe in a path and like get other people on board, get co-founders or whoever on board, and you're like, I'm re- I really think this could work, and then it doesn't. And, and, and then it makes that next time around feel like, you know, there's so much, I guess, baggage that could creep into that where it's like, oh, am I still trusted? The last thing I recommended didn't work out. Like, yeah. uh, and I think we've got to really change the relationship to that because I think, I think in an attempt to prevent that next failure, we put in this like these like rigorous planning cycles, you know? So it's like, we have to be able to like predict the future somehow before trying the next thing that might fail. And that's when things just slow down, like innovation just grinds to a halt, you know? So you gotta be able to, but I I do think I've been thinking about this a lot as like, there's some middle ground there, you know, what, what's the, because sometimes you get into this like sunk cost theory, you know, where you're like so far down the path, you, you keep trying to make it work. So I think the middle ground is just to, like you said, I, I really like how you frame that just as like not trying enough things is the big mistake. I think it's like, how do you design smarter series of experiments like in parallel to each other rather than sequentially, yeah. you know, like go all in on this thing. And then when that doesn't work, try this other thing that that can cost a lot of money and, and time. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. I mean, I think it's like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like stoicism has become very popular in the startup world over the past like 15 years. And I think, uh, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm not like a stoic in the purest sense of it, but like, I, I don't hold a lot of attachment 
to the things that we do, right? I like I'm I I like I'm ideal idealistic and romantic when about the idea because I think that's what helps bring it to life. <clears throat> but if it doesn't work, I have no problem in just being like fuck that, you know? Like I actually look back on like my goal is like in a lot of ways is like look back on the work that I did in the past and be like embarrassed by it because that means that I'm getting better. And so like I think you know it's like it's important to have the mindset you know, like of, and like, you know, this is something Russ and I are, you know, we talk a lot about is like, is like, um, like we can't be too precious. Right. And like when you're, when you're too precious with stuff, I think it's like, um, you get, you get attached and it, I, I like, and I've, I've, I'm, I made this mistake and I, it burned me like really, really hard with my last company where all the signs were there that like something wasn't working. And it was just like, Hey, just like a little bit more money and like a little bit more time. It's right there. Like we're right around the corner and that corner never was there, man. It was like the the road just kept getting longer. And so like, you know, something that, that we do at freestyle and something that is, I think like just absolutely fundamental to business. Once again, going back to numbers is like setting goals and reaching and you know, and using data once again to kind of inform your decision making. And that way you can say like, let's say you're launching a company and <clears throat> you're self-funding, you're bootstrapped. It's like, okay, like how much money do I think I need to put together to kind of give this thing a real shot? Right. And like the exercise in doing that is going to develop your business plan first and foremost, but it's going to give you a framework to work within. Right. And so then it's like, Okay, cool. Let's just say it's like twenty five thousand dollars, or it's two hundred fifty thousand, or you're loaded and it's a million dollars, right? Like, just be diligent with like those numbers, and like be diligent with like your expenses on like how we're going to spend this money, and how we're going to use that data to inform whether or not this is working. There's like um, my first job ever was ironically I was a mortgage trader, which is probably a big surprise, um, and it was like at the peak. And I was like 22 years old. I was like the young guy, but like, you know, one of the things I learned from some of like the best traders was like, you know, is like having the kind of like diligence to cut a loss, you know, early or like take your win, you know, like early and like have those numbers. Like, say you make a million dollar bet, right? Okay. I know that if this goes to 800 K, I'll lose 200K, but I'm not going to lose 300. I'm out, right? And they they have those numbers in their head before they put on the trade. Or on the high side, right? Like if I'm going to... My goal is to return 200K. As soon as I get there, cool. I'm taking... I'm pocketing the money. What people that don't have that discipline, what happens is it goes to 800 and then it goes to 700 and then it's 600. And they're like, shit, I'd like it's still there. It's still there. And it's never there. Or it's like, it goes to 1.2, it goes to 1.5, it goes to 2, and then it goes down to 1.5, 1.2, you know, and then it's like, it's like it was there. And then if they had just had the discipline to kind of like take take the win or, or cut the loss, they'd feel a lot better about it. Because once again, it's like that one trade wasn't going to make them retire, most likely, right? They're not going to like make that trade and be like, fuck it. Like I'm moving to the Bahamas or whatever, right? It's like, hopefully that's one of thousands of similar trades that they can do. And over the course of time, the accumulation of all of those things is their portfolio of their work. And so um, I think having that kind of mindset as you go into stuff, you know, like we have a very specific marketing budget, right? And so we like are very clear about like, this is our marketing budget. This is our CAC. We have to hit this CAC. We try things. If they're not even close to this CAC, it's done. You know, we assign, you know, a uh, <clears throat> percentage of that budget to the different channels that we're trying. And we just are constantly monitoring those numbers, you know? And like, you're always kind of shooting for like a certain goal. If you're not, like, you're just like, you're, it's like, what are you doing? Like, you're just, you're just trying shit for the sake of trying shit. And you're not even, you know, you're not even, in, you're not informing yourself. You're not learning. You're not getting better. So on the on that note, and I, I think how you're thinking about that cost to acquire customer and and using that like discipline and rigor, you know the 
depending on the industry, but across most industries, that kind of discipline is more important than ever, just with the economy in flux and a lot of uncertainty for people. Um, how, how has that kind of economic state of things impacted your team in terms of the both the strategy and tactics you're using for marketing? I mean, you know, it's, it's hard for us to really think too much about that right now because we're still so small in like the world. Right. And <clears throat> those are, that's like something that we can't necessarily control. And um, there's always going to be like, highs and lows in the economy and the market. And, you know, we could like lower our price to uh, serve, you know, to, you know, appeal to a larger uh, audience that to afford our product, but then we, we won't have the profit that we need to like keep the business running. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, a personally, like, I really don't know what this, if there is going to be like this major recession because it's, you know, they've talked about it for a long time. And I don't know if you saw the inflation print this morning, it's down a lot. Like, you know, the fed might've actually done a pretty good job of getting us, you know, to like a quote unquote soft landing. Of course, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And I think that's the thing is like, we don't know what's going to happen and it's not something that we can control. So, you know, like we'll, you know, there's a certain, margin that we have to live within and we have to kind of build our business around that margin. And, um, you know, if like certain macro events affect that in a negative way, like it's just, that's life, I guess. I don't know if it's <laughs> to all of my investors. I hope that's the right answer you want to hear. <laughs> but I, I really don't know. Like, I don't, I honestly don't, um, companies have survived, recessions like hundreds and thousands of companies have, have survived recessions so like I, I i think obviously there's you know you have to kind of be smart about it but like you know we're not like right now like thinking too much about it well you already have that discipline in place around i mean i, I appreciate where you're coming from on this that in an up economy yeah. or a down economy you as a startup you yeah. have to keep enough on hand to keep going. Um, yeah. So it's like, yeah. It, it and like be fro frothy in the economy, but you still have your own company's reality to worry about. Yeah. And it's like, you know, once again, like I said, like, you know, these things are, are never overnight, you know? So it's like, sometimes a company is going to have to just like kind of go quiet, relatively quiet for a little bit and like cut back to like, you know, like a skeleton crew. And, and the hope is that like that skeleton skeleton crew lasts long enough to where like once things start turning around, you can ramp back up, right? I think that's probably the way to think about it. Um, you know, I think it's it's like, you know, it's like don't be dumb, right? Like I, I think you need to be aware, you know, like don't like you know over the past year there's been like a lot of contraction in the in the in the market, uh, specifically related to like private company funding. And, um, and, uh, there was a lot of founders that, you know, um, were ahead of it and cut, cut back on, on expenses and team and, uh, have set themselves up a lot better for founders that were like six to seven months too late to that decision. And they're like, fuck, we need to like raise all this money and they're in a really bad spot. So I think you just, you know, you gotta be aware of the situation, but, um, you know, like at the end of the day, you gotta, you still gotta like, you know, you can't alter the kind of the fundamentals of what your product is as a result. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I appreciate the honesty, um, in your answers. And I think one of the great things you guys have going for you too, is that the products you all create and, 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 and sell, it's not like people's need for them is just going to go away. So, um, yeah, obviously people That's in different thing. types of, yeah, yeah. And people in different yeah. industries. I mean, geez, if you were selling speed boats right now or like super high end saunas, you know, it's a different situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you can argue though that, you know, a lot of these like, uh, you know, there's the, the, the theme of the rich getting richer and, you know, a lot of these like luxury items are, are recession proof in their own weird way. I mean, we do think about like, 
mean, you know, it's like we, we do think about the fact that like, you know, where our price point is, <clears throat> you know, like compared to like a ultra premium diaper brand, you know, is the difference in our price and their price going to be enough where like a lot of their customers are like, oh, you know what, like that extra 150 or $200 a year, it's worth me switching diaper brands. Like maybe, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Is $200 going to be material enough for them to like in a, in a recessionary environment to switch over to a, a, from a product that they like to try something new? Maybe some of them, you know, like, is it, is it going to be enough? Like, is it going to benefit us? Or is it, you know, or like same thing for us. Like how many people are going to look at our price and be like, damn, well, there's these other diapers that are, you know, they're like, they're $8 a pack, you know, like, and, and they're still diapers. So, you know, it's, it's, that's what I'm saying. Like, we can't, like, we don't know like how bad or what's going to actually happen. So it's something that we can't totally control and we can't, just completely alter the fundamentals of our business as a result. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, well, Mike, we're at time right now. It was so good uh, hanging and hearing your perspective on so many different interesting things. Um, any final tips or thoughts about building a brand or running a startup or life or parenting that you want to share with, <laughs> with our listeners? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I think that one thing is just like, it's like, I always, I always, and like I say this to, to a lot of people because it's, I also, I'm doing it to remind myself all the time is like, it's all, it's like, it's all about those baby steps, right? It's all about just like breaking things down into like actionable tasks that don't overwhelm you because like that's where everybody falls apart is they lose focus, they get overwhelmed, and then they get paralysis. And I think the most important thing is like, it's not what do you need to do in a year from now? It's like, what's like, even if it's just like, what is the one thing that you can do today that's going to like get you to another thing tomorrow and another thing? It's like that whole thing. Like, you know, it's like, oh, 1% better every day, right? Like, it's like, like, I think it's hard to do that with like your personal self in a way, right? But like, when you have like something tangible, like creating something or building something, it's very easy to kind of like have a to-do list and just like, cool. Like I did those three things today. Now I can go play with my kids and feel good about the fact that like I made some progress. Did I like make us a billion dollar company today? No, that's literally fucking impossible. Right. But like, if I keep checking things off my to-do list in 10 years, could I be a billion dollar company? Like, yeah. You know, did I get to play with my kids along the way? Yeah. Did I get to like, you know, learn and be better at what I do along the way? Yeah. Like, you know, like, I don't know. Like for me, it's like the, it's like the, the like craftsmanship, if you will, of like starting and building and creating things is a skill like anything else. Right. And like when you start, you suck and like, you're always going to like, the goal is to always get better at that skill. You know, like I do Brazilian jujitsu. I'm a brown belt. I've been doing it for like a long time. Some days I like leave, like Monday I left the gym and I was just like, fuck yes. Like I am good at this. Yesterday I left the gym and I was like, I fucking suck. You know, like, but like, it's like, I, you know, like everyone, it's like, it's, but you know what? I keep going. Right. And like the, the goal is that the trend is like this, not like this and definitely not like this. Right. So it's like, it's going to be like this. Right. And so I think like, as long as you just focus on the, the idea is just like, you just want that chart to keep going this way. And like, the only way to do that is by doing little things along the way and like not trying to, it's, it's like, I don't know. I'm not like a win the day person. I'm a like, like, like do something today person. Cause I think that that's still better than like 99% of people out there. Right. And like, you're going to learn so much and you're going to feel so good. And, you know, like a lot of times, like, I mean, I deal with a lot of anxiety and depression and like, sometimes I get stuck and it's like the thing that always makes me feel good is like, if I, okay, go back to my to-do list. What's the easiest thing on my to-do list I can do right now? <laughs> like the one dumb thing I could, okay, boom. Okay. Send that email. What's the next thing? Okay. Boom. Oh, the next thing, you know, like you built that fucking deck that you've been delaying doing for like weeks, you know, it's like that one little thing just sparks the movement, you know, like it's the snowball taking it all back. Right. Just get it rolling. 
Thank, thanks for sharing that and, and being vulnerable about that. Uh, I, it, you reminded me of something that, that I share with my son. I have a three-year-old and he, you know, sometimes it's like just doing something simple as you know, can be maddening. And I've really been like for close to two years, been trying to like really practice, like, like manage, just managing my mindset about dealing with those moments at home when like he's freaking out and the dog's barking at the mailman or whatever, which is always at like five thirty PM. And I just like, I used to like, you know, two years ago, every day at that time, I'd be like, this is so fucked in my head. That's like what I was saying. Yeah. Cause, cause it just was like hot and these things were happening. And I just, I was like, man, this is like my narrative about my evening at home. I've got to fix this, you know? And I just practiced just my response to the dog. Like, it's yeah. okay. Instead of yelling at him, like, shut the fuck up <laughs> to be like, I, I'm going to walk over to him calmly and pet him. And I started yeah. doing that. Like, I would say I'm up to like three out of four times. I'll just do it that way. Yeah. I still sometimes lose my mind. But I, I, I've said to my son, like, if I start to get impatient with him or if he blows it and he's like telling me he hates me or something, <laughs> like, hey, we're just, we're still learning, right? And I'm like, I'm going to, I'm a grown up. I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to do this. Yeah. And I was like, and I'm like, but we always work it out, right? And uh, it's, it's funny how just telling him that and like trying to teach him that has kind of, taught me that too like just a little bit of grace for myself too in that like I, I like how you showed that kind of wavy up up and to the right you know you're gonna sometimes go a few steps forward and then a few steps right back to where you started and then I like that mindset though just you just keep going with it um well cool Mike hey thanks so much um again for being on if people want to learn more about you and follow you online or and or freestyle what are the best places to find you guys yeah i mean our our instagram is definitely like our like kind of main face like free it's uh, at freestyle.world um you know i'm on instagram if you want to find me there linkedin 